Thank you for that, but I expect we can catch up with you already the same time as you read or not. <laughs> <laughs> this evening, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the keynote speaker for this evening. Her keynote is a prominent journalist, a great mentor, and an outstanding American citizen. I'm not using these attributes just for a long introduction. This, this is the description of an action to align with the man we are about to hear this evening. He once responded to my comments about restoring the mind here of his bodies. The letter is the most important one. It would make a first trip of the editorial piece. It is important, it seems to me, that we share the thoughts with hundreds of thousands of parameters. So how about sending me a picture and a little background? I'll combine that with your piece, with your piece and I will run it someday soon. A few days later, I commented a few years later, I commented about another story that was about home coming to the lane. And I wrote him sharing my experience with Thomas Moore. And I got a letter back from him. And I have forwarded your letter to Thomas Moore later, and I hope you don't mind. A few days later, I got a letter from we have a good to hear from you. I still remember the discussion that we had about Dr. Mayed, a Pakistani surgeon who performed surgery in my daughter. He was a wonderful physician. I had my breakfast every Tuesday at Jimmy's in London. Why don't you come this way? Internet is loaded with our speaker's accomplishments as a journalist. He retired from a profession as a newsman and became a citizen activist for early childhood education. The above two letters, as I mentioned, demonstrate how he took time to fight the mental ordinary when he had readers like myself. And talking about outstanding American citizen, he is a man of vision, wisdom, he is listening tonight. And I must say that you're in for a free. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Williams. Not in America, I promise you. Asalaamu <laughs> uh, Alaikum. It's a privilege to be with you this evening. You're in fact the already converted choir. You already know what is right and fair and good in this world and you don't need me to preach to you. The reason for this evening is, seems to be exemplified in our honorees, Shirley Gibson and David Lamford and Carmen Vizcayana. I was particularly struck, if you'll let me say this, by what Carmen had to say this evening. It makes me feel awful good about the United States of America, a flawed country, but one that at least and frequently tries to be fair. Seems to me that all the honorees are people eager to learn all their lives, have an eagerness to understand others, have the basic values of integrity and fairness and openness. And so like you, I feel blessed by them. You and I live in a big place, bigger in fact than 16 states in the United States of America. By some measurements, we are the single most diverse area in these United States. We have a very special opportunity of perhaps being the preview of the America we would want to be. We're surrounded in this community by enormous, sometimes even stunning wealth, and profound poverty. One in every 
five of Miami-Dade children lives in the full federal definition of poverty. One in five in the richest and frequently the most generous country in the world. 70% of our public elementary school students qualify for free or reduced lunches. We are a community, as you know, of exiles and immigrants and refugees and minorities. Though I would point out to you in this room that though I will not be alive to see it, there will be people in this room who will be alive when what we call minorities in this country will be in the majority. This is a community that has a population at enormous risk of and reality of stress on children and families and communities and I would say early brain development. I worry these days more than maybe I did before about both community and country. I promise you I'm not a socialist, but I worry about the really rich getting even richer. I worry about the lessening proportion of the middle class in this country. I worry about the poor getting ever poorer. And here we are, the richest country by far on the face of the earth, and in our own state, two and a half million Floridians live in full poverty, which not incidentally is an increase of a half million people in the last couple of years. How could it happen in a country of this goodness and this generosity? I worry about the deficits we are piling up, built, I would argue, from the egos of unchecked greed and got to have it now mentality. I worry about the loss of self-discipline and, frankly, the rise of anything goes permissiveness. I think we are pushing the envelope so far, I don't know how much further it can be pushed. I worry about the uncivil nature and frequently hateful words of public discourse. Aided and abetted by the lousiest economy I have seen in my own lifetime. I worry about immigrant bashing. Harkening back to the nativist movements we have seen arise from time to time in the last 200 years of history of this country. I worry about the forthcoming 10th anniversary of 9-11, whether we are wise enough to use the occasion to build an understanding among all of us, among all Americans. And we simply must because the future of our country depends on this. You and I live in a world where the Muslim population will grow at the rate of double double the rate of non-Muslims over the next two decades, and the Muslim population of our own country will double at the same time. I worry about Islamophobia, just as I worry about anti-Semitism and racism and xenophobia. I worry about idiotic Koran burners and Israel haters and all sorts of other misguided and frankly not infrequently malevolent souls, some of whom find a way in the media and elsewhere of dividing us. And I would say, make no mistake about it, our very future depends on mutual understanding, depends on respecting differences and celebrating what we have in common, depends on learning about and appreciating our neighbors, all our neighbors, I say it not by way of bragging that I read at least a book a week and have all my life. And I'm only getting started on learning. Learning, it seems to be, is a lifelong responsibility, a lifelong opportunity, indeed a lifetime of joy. 
I say with enormous respect for what David and Miriam and Miriam and John and others produce, that I am deeply worried. This is the hardest backdrop I've ever had. <laughs> Islamic group I to be <laughs> I worry about the diminishing appetite for good journalism and how many people especially young people simply are so little informed about public life and public policy I pause for just a second to tell you that I have been in the process of hiring a web director, a major position for the children's movement of Florida. And because I wanted to learn more about this, we had 100 plus applicants and I interviewed the 11 most promising people. All were Floridians, all were college graduates, and three quarters of them did not know the name of the governor of Florida. So, you ought to be worried. You ought to be worried that people think that they pick up a little snippet on Blackberry or they see something on Fox News or they get one site or the other delivering them something and somehow think that they are informed, educated, know what's going on. I worry for the very future of the Republic of the United States of America about the ignorance in our midst. I promise you that you are not presented a democracy and just get to keep it. There are people in this room who have intimate, first-hand knowledge. I think of what Carmen said about Cuba. But I think of Pakistan and many other places. And I promise you that only an informed citizenry could possibly keep a democracy. I worry to tell you the truth and in every way about education. I worry because our community's future and this country's future will depend on growing more and better educated people. So I give you one statistic. A study that was done 14 months ago, released nationally by a group of senior retired admirals and generals. And what did that study tell us? 75%, three out of every four young people, 17 to 24, in the United States of America cannot enter the American military. Can't enter the American military because they've got an academic problem, a criminal justice problem, a physical problem, or a substance abuse problem. 